Welcome to a special edition of Inside Town Government. Uh, yeah, we will be talking about certainly issues that will impact the town of North Attleboro, but we are speaking to a candidate for state senate. He is the Democratic candidate representing uh, this area if elected, and his name is Christopher Alexoff. Chris? Nice to meet you, Peter. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you very much. Chris made the trip down from uh, Wayland. How, how do you get to North Attleboro from Wayland? Is it 93 or d back roads? It depends on the time of the day. 495 usually, and then you uh, hop, hop down on 495 to Attleboro. Well, we'll try to get you out of here early enough so you can uh, make it back before rush hour. Thanks, Peter. Uh, first question I have, and people watching this probably saying, who is Chris Alexa? Is it, is it Alexoff? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, so, I moved to Massachusetts in 2009. Uh, uh, my grandfather uh, uh, had an accident and called me and he said, uh, Chris, I, I need you out here, son. I have to have surgery. And so I you know, got in my car that day, uh, drove here, got there and realized that uh, uh, he had been living alone for a while and uh, he needed more help than he let on. And so uh, after a surgery, I, I uh, stuck with him and, and he moved in with me and I still look after him to this day. So. I had planned to go to law school back in Michigan, and uh, I was lucky enough to get into UMass Law, the new law school. I went to law school there, I uh, was on the Law Review, graduated, passed the bar, and started my own practice in 2013. Uh, it's it's uh, a big, well, it was the main influencer on me probably running this term. Uh, as part of my practice, I represent uh, low-income individuals and uh, elderly people in subsidized, mostly subsidized housing cases. And uh, as an attorney, um, you really, when you have a case, you really want to help those people. And, and it, there are situations that arose, and I, I think of one specifically. Uh, uh, I, w I, was, uh, I was in Brockton at the housing court there, and, and uh, uh, a young man, couldn't be more than 14 years old, came in carrying one of his sisters, uh, had the other one in tow, uh, holding her hand. And he comes up to me and he says, sir, uh, you know, I have this eviction notice. Uh, what does this mean? I don't, you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I said, well, you know, so where's your mom? Where's your dad? And he said, I don't know. And I said, okay, well, uh, you know, they, can you get them here? Do you, you know, is there any way to get them here? And he said, no. And at that point, you realize that he, he really doesn't know where his family is, and he has nowhere to go. And as an attorney, when you can't help someone like that, uh, uh, when there isn't and there isn't an immediate uh, a solution to prevent that without the charity of someone else or without asking uh, uh, an organization if they have room to put uh, these children in uh, a place. Or, or even worse, I mean, you, you don't know what will happen if, you, let's say, you call DCF, you don't know what will happen to them. Uh, and so, in, in my mind at that moment, I realized that if I really want to help people, it's going to be through public service, it's going to be through the government for changing policies so that kids like him there's a solution, an easy one, uh, that doesn't disrupt their life uh, terribly. And, there, and that is, I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm running, Peter. So, so is, it, uh, is it the state that's dropping the ball? Is it the federal government that's dropping the ball, or, or a combination of both? It's a bureaucracy that's dropping the ball. Uh, uh, subsidized housing is very complex. There are different voucher programs. There are different uh, uh, housing authorities. Each town has their own housing authority. They follow their own rules and regulations. Uh, but there's not one person you can go to, there's not one person who's responsible uh, uh, when in a situation like I described earlier. So, b b Before we get into more of the issues, uh, sure. more about Chris Alexoff. You, you mentioned uh, you, you came back from Michigan, but you, your mm. dad was back here. W where did you go to high school, for example? Oh, where, where were you raised so in Massachusetts or out of Michigan? I was born and raised in East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, I, I moved around. Uh, lived in Chicago for a while. I used to spend my summers out in Wayland with my grandfather. Uh, he came here, gosh, from Trinidad, and it was 19, I couldn't even, 1963. Uh, uh, 
got an education. We ended up uh, as a club manager of Pine Brook Country Club for uh, 20 years. And uh, my father, he uh, came to this country from Macedonia at the age of 13. Uh, on a boat, worked, it, worked and lived in a bakery in Jackson, Michigan for uh, the first three years of his life. To this day, he can't stand the smell of bread being baked, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you don't blame him. And uh, uh, from there, I, I, it's, uh, it, it, I'm very lucky to be here. Uh, and I think especially when I'm out on the campaign trail, meeting other people with similar stories uh, and thinking how easy, not easy I will say, but, but how the American dream for my family progressed to have me here sitting in front of you today, I don't know if that's I don't know if that's as reachable as it was 20 or 30 years ago. Right? And so I am thankful for that. And I think that uh, uh, getting back to that, you know, making it easier for people to rise up the, the income or the uh, socioeconomic ladder is absolutely important. I always ask this when someone runs against an incumbent. Richard Ross, of course, is the incumbent. Uh, certainly well known in, in this neck of the district, mm -hmm. which it's a very interesting district when you look at a map. Uh, to run against an incumbent, is that a sign that, you know what, Richard Ross is not doing a good job, I want to do a better job? Mm -hmm. I think there are certainly areas where Richard Ross uh, uh, has not done a great job. I think on the medical, mar well, the medical marijuana issue and now the legalization issue, uh, I think you have to recognize that if, there's, if this passes, it's the will of the people and your job is to implement that and do it in a way that's safe. Uh, that makes sense and that avoids, uh, you know, wasting taxpayer dollars. Uh, from my understanding, he, he went to Colorado to study this issue and he came back with talking points. He didn't come back with any solutions. If this passes, we should do this or we can fix it by doing this. We can avoid what happened in Colorado by doing this. And I think as is a, is a, is a legislature who's been, as you said, around in this area for, uh, gosh, what is it, I think it's six years in the Senate and before that it was the, the, the House. Yeah. Uh, you think he would have some experience coming up with solutions to problems like this. I mean, it's not a, we know it's coming, we know it's a strong possibility that we're going to have to deal with it. But how, how is he going to deal with it? Which, if I'm not mistaken, and based upon a conversation I had with him, the law that passed in Colorado somehow became part of the Constitution, and therefore the legislature could not tweak it I and improve it where in Massachusetts, the way the question is written, yes, it would pass, but some of the flaws, potential flaws, could be corrected by the legislature. Well, sure. And I think in Colorado, there would still be possibilities to do that as well. I mean, uh, state governments define the way words are interpreted all the time uh, without changing the meaning constitutionally. Uh, that would certainly be one possibility in Colorado. But also in Colorado, the fact that you can't change it, you can see what's going wrong and seeing what happens if you don't try to change it. Right? So I think it's a great example of, of for us to, to uh, learn from and, and figure out ways to avoid those problems. Essentially, you know, they have a huge tax out there too. I think it's something like 29%. It's making it uh, almost prohibitive uh, to find uh, marijuana at prices that, that are better than the black market. Right? And so that's a real consideration you, you, you have to if the, if the idea is to avoid people having to go to, to drug dealers to get this uh, uh, marijuana, then keeping it at a price that's uh, better than the black market is absolutely essential. I mean, Massachusetts did approve medical marijuana. Question four on the ballot when we go to the polls on November 8th will legalize marijuana for, for social purposes. You, you won't be able to smoke it in public, but you would be able to buy it legally and smoke it in your own home. So, so I take it you are in favor of question four? I, I'm realistic about the fact that it's probably going to pass, and I essentially believe that if, if the voting people choose for, for uh, you know, a ballot initiative to pass, then it's my obligation if I was a, a legislator to implement it and do it in a safe uh, way that avoids wasting taxpayer dollars. I personally believe, uh, I do, I do think, I believe uh, it should pass. Now one of the uh, arguments against question four is the fact that marijuana is, is a gateway drug and we're opening up the door for people to get into more serious drugs. Uh, do you buy that argument? I absolutely don't buy that argument. I think what you're doing is actually slamming the door on people having to go to drug dealers to buy uh, something that, you know, they can get anywhere, right? Uh, it's important to, if we have a chance to regulate it and prevent people from having to go uh, uh, to drug dealers who have other drugs with them, I mean, uh, 
it's a no-brainer, really. Uh, why not regulate it? Why not tax it? Why not be in control of it rather than just leave it out there uh, when you really don't know who has it, you don't know the strength of it, you don't know what other dangers are lurking around. Uh, um, so I don't buy that argument. Another big question, and certainly a question that you know communities like North Attleboro, which are struggling financially and certainly struggling as far as the educational budget are concerned, is the question about allowing more charter schools in mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. state of Massachusetts. Uh, somebody watching this, okay, th this Chris Alexoff seems like a good, I wonder where he stands in the charter question. Yeah. Now. Where do you stand? So I, I'm against the charter question, uh, but more on principle than on the fact that it, uh, it's, a, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult slippery slope here. We have, we have uh, parents who want their children to have the best education they can get. And so you can't, uh, you can't fault them for wanting that. Uh, on the other end, we have uh, uh, Massachusetts, the state, we founded public education right over there in Franklin, uh, Horace Mann, uh, read books at the library donated by Benjamin Franklin, and from those books decided that public education was something he was going to go after. So he went over to Prussia, to learn their system, brought it back, and his system is the system we Im implemented all over the country today. Uh, and the ideals that were behind public education are still the same ideals, I think, that we have today. Uh, free education is a great equalizer between all the classes, all the races. It makes better citizens. It provides order. It helps the economy. And it's meant to be a public good. And I think over the years, we, we've, uh, we've kind of gone away from that. We, I don't know if we look at it like a public good like we used to. It was for the betterment of our entire society, our entire culture. And so I think, and Democrats are par partially to blame for this question being on the ballot right now. I, obviously, obviously, we could have funded it better. We could have recommitted to the idea of public education. And, uh, and I think charter schools are the result of, of some of the faults of Democrats in funding uh, places without great tax bases, like uh, uh, Attleboro, for instance. Uh, and so without fixing the way that the funding is, is, is currently uh, expended, uh, it's natural that charter schools would uh, spring up. I, I forgot to ask you your, your thoughts on the presidential election. We've, uh, as we said in the studio, there's been one presidential debate. There's been one uh, vice presidential debate. Uh, the television advertising is, mm. as far as I'm concerned, is absolutely ridiculous of the, where it's going. And as we said in the studio, there's still three weeks to go before election yeah. day. We're not done yet. <laughs> it's going to get worse before it gets better, I imagine. I, I think... Uh, it's a no-brainer. Uh, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you, you have one man who says that, uh, you know, that war heroes, <laughs> you know, he only likes war heroes who aren't captured. He calls women pigs. Uh, he he uh, ridicules a man who lost his son uh, fighting for our country. And then on the other end, you, you're a woman who, who has her own faults. Uh, I'm, I'm a Democrat, and I'll tell you that. I mean, she's not perfect, but she has a plan. Uh, she's not she probably won't embarrass us as much as Donald Trump will, and uh, honestly, I, I don't see there's any other choice besides Hillary Clinton in this election. Um, and uh, I'm interested to know how, how Republicans can, can justify voting for Donald Trump. I mean, he has no experience, and if you don't want experience, I guess that's great. But I, I want my president to have experience, and there's probably nobody more experienced uh, than Hillary Clinton. She's held, uh, for better or worse, she's held a number of, of positions. She has great foreign policy experience. She has. You know, I've been saying the same thing about uh, children and, and the rights of women and equal pay for as long as she's been around. But granted, she could have handled her emails better. Um, there are certain situations I think that that I, I'm sympathetic with uh, conservatives and Republicans on. Um, but at the same time, it's it's what's best for this country. It's really not a choice, and you know, there's no real choice here. You're really picking Hillary Clinton. I mean, in my opinion, at least. I you have, in my opinion, and it'll be mm. interesting to see if you agree, I think a, a little bit of an edge over the incumbent, Senator Richard Ross, and that is the fact that you know, Massachusetts, let's face it, will elect Hillary Clinton, and she'll get all of the, uh, the electoral votes from the state of Massachusetts. Mm. So with that many people going to the, the left side of the ballot, mm. does that help? the Democratic candidate for state Senate? I, I honestly don't know if it does. I mean, um, like you said, incumbents are very hard to unseat. And uh, Richard's been around a long time, and it's not because he's, he's terrible at what he does, right? 
On the other hand, it, it is a choice to be a Republican. You choose to be a Democrat, you choose to be a Republican, and by choosing that, you adhere to those values. And for me, if, uh, if I were my, my, the shoe was on the other foot and Donald Trump was my candidate, I can't associate with a man like that. I can't have a person like that as the leader of my party. I just can't. I, I'm so diametrically opposed to almost everything he says. The, the choice is easy. It's almost, it's almost a moral choice at this point. If, if you don't believe the things he says, if you don't believe the stances he takes on, on women, on gay rights, on abortion, uh, or, or, or any of the crazy things he says, then you really have to look at why you are a Republican or why you are in a party at all. Um, so I guess that's the best way I can, I can answer that question. You brought up a point about Donald Trump, and I, and I think it's a very good one, and that's mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, this person's running for president of the United States. He has no political experience. I'm sure there are people who uh, look at you as a candidate and say, okay, he's running for state senate. He has no political experience. Shouldn't he be starting somewhere as a selectman or something like that and working his way up? No, I mean, that's a fair criticism, right? Uh, but there are also a lot of people who will say that they don't like the way our state government is run. Uh, they're sick of having career politicians who, who, you know, sit up there and get comfortable. Uh, I think Richard Ross even said it at one point, you know, you either move up or you move on. And he's uh, yet to move on. And so uh, it's, a fair, it's a fair criticism. But I, I don't think, in, at least in my case, that it's very relevant. Uh, uh, I'm, I don't, won't have my finger on the nuclear uh, button, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, I'm very good at listening to people, especially uh, people with problems. That's a big part of my job. And I think that's a big part of any legislator's job. You listen to the people. What, is, what do they need help with? What are their real concerns? And if you can do that, I think uh, the rest of it, if you work hard, the rest of it will come along too, you know. Massachusetts is, and it's no s secret, and I mentioned it earlier, is a blue state. Uh, you go up to the state house, and I was at the state house yesterday, the, the majority of the members of the House of Representatives are Democrats. The majority of the senators are Democrats. Now, there is Charlie Baker, a Republican uh, governor, but uh, does a district like North Attleboro, or a town like North Attleboro, in a district that it has a Republican House member, a Republican senator, does that hurt the town of North Attleboro when it comes time uh, to try to get something passed in the House and Senate? If they have a Republican, you said? Yes. I think Which is the case now, yeah, because North Attleboro is unique in that they have one of the few Republican absolutely. representatives and one of the few Republican senators. I think if people, uh, uh, I think most people in North Attleboro can probably answer that question. I mean, uh, Richard Ross, for all, for all his good traits, he, he doesn't introduce legislation that passes because he's a Republican. He doesn't get the same uh, uh, treatment from uh, his fellow uh, uh, legislators because he's a Republican. And so if you, if you, voting for a Republican in the state, for better or worse, is essentially voting against your interests, right, when it, com when it comes to the legislature. And so I certainly think that has hurt North Attleboro, and I certainly think that uh, if I'm elected, a lot of those issues won't be issues. What kind of job, in your opinion, is the Republican governor, Charlie Baker, doing? I think on, on many issues, especially on the opioid issue, he, he championed that, and, and you you have to admit that that was, he did it effectively, and he did it quickly, and it was a good job. Uh, I think we heard last week, uh, he also has uh, uh, political appointees or who are spending taxpayer dollars on parties, and uh, instead of firing them, or, or, you know, he says, I'm gonna wait for the investigation to unfold. And one resigned and one was fired. Uh, and to me, he should have instantly, instantly come out against that and say, you know, this is absolutely wrong. I knew this, I knew this happened. Uh, I mean, it was a huge party. He had to know it happened, right? So uh, uh, for me, that, that was very troubling, very troubling. But overall, I think it's hard to say he's doing a terrible job. Could a Democrat do a better job? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, based on what? Based on the fact that, uh, well, having the support of the House and the Senate gives you a lot more leverage to implement uh, uh, unpopular or I guess you could say difficult, difficult legislation. We have a lot of it coming forward that we can't even really act on. MBTA, uh, infrastructure's falling apart. Uh, I don't see that happening under Charlie. I just don't see the two sides being able to come to a deal on that. And those are the big issues are the ones we need to get fixed and they need to be fixed now. 
Uh, and I certainly think uh, uh, Joe Kennedy or um, you know, anyone of that stature would do a great job as governor of the state. Well, what does it say about the state of Massachusetts? And let's face it, it is, once again, I'm saying it's a, mm -hmm. it's a blue state. That's no secret. Uh, majority of the members in the House are Democrats. The majority of the members mm -hmm. in the Senate are Democrats. And yet, the people time and time again, William Well, Paul Salucci, and now Charlie Baker, have elected a Republican governor. Mm -hmm. Is that the base state's... Uh, version of checks and balances? It could be, I mean, certainly. But we've, they were also successful governors. I mean, Romney uh, uh, put... Mitt Romney, I forgot about Mitt, Mitt Romney. Romney. I mean, he put in the, the health care system that essentially was not the same that we have nationally, but I mean, it was the idea, right? And I think, uh, I think overall, I mean, this state is mostly unenrolled, unenrolled people. Uh, and so in a, in a statewide race, that hasn't been, uh, where the districts haven't been drawn uh, for one party or the other or, or is conservative and liberal, I think you'll find that we're, we're very, very in the middle. When you, put all, when you put the left and the right together, they end up right in the middle. And I think Charlie Baker is a very moderate Republican as far as they go. And I think that was the reason, you know, he was elected, you know. And, and Martha Coakley could have ran a lot better campaign. One of the issues that Charlie Baker has uh, tried to tackle is uh, improving the MBTA. And let's face it, two years ago, two winters ago, we had a winter like we, we haven't seen, certainly in my lifetime, with the amount of snow. And you have aging cars, aging tracks, and there were a number of breakdowns. It was even shut down for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he seems to have tried to make improvements, but every time he does, he runs into a union that uh, isn't going to back down. Uh, if, if Chris Alexoff were elected state senator and was granted the head of the Transportation Committee, mm -hmm. what would you do about the MBTA? It has, to be, it has to start first with the idea that whatever you do, it's not to get elected again, right? Uh, I don't plan to be a, a, a Richard Ross type of senator. I don't plan to be here. Uh, more than a couple terms if I win. Uh, I love what I do. I love my practice. But there are hard decisions that have to be made. There is going to be a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of fat to cut at the MBTA. And let's be honest, it's not working. It's not working. I mean, it's great that we have this public service that we subsidize, but uh, uh, compared to the other cities in this country, the big ones with the transportation systems, it, we're way at the bottom. And it's, unac it's unacceptable. We have some of the smartest people in the entire world in a five mile radius in, in a city with one of the worst uh, uh, transportation systems. Uh, clearly, th I mean, the, MB the MBTA is an institution that's been around for a long, long time, and there are a lot of entrenched uh, uh, pos you know, positions there. And uh, someone's got to be brave and be bold enough to go in and say, hey, look, this can't keep going on. We've got to cut fat. We need to update this infrastructure. If we have to take out loans to do it, we'll do it. But there can't be any blowback for it. It's just got to happen. It's just got to happen. There are many who feel that uh, the state laws and uh, taxes are behind the times. Years ago, uh, if someone wanted transportation, they would either call if they lived in a, a small town like North Attleboro mm -hmm. or probably Whalen, or in a big city, uh, hail a taxi. Now you have uh, Uber, I think you have Lyft. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure while we're talking, two or three more have already yeah. launched. Yeah. Uh, if you wanted to stay somewhere, uh, there were professional bed and breakfasts, there were hotels, motels, in you stay at, mm. and now people are starting, I believe it's called Airbnb, mm. uh, I'm not even sure what that means, Air Bread and Breakfast, I believe. Uh, the legislature and Senator Ross voted no to uh, taxes being paid when people stay at, at someone's house. Uh, was, was that a bad vote? I, I, I think it was. Uh, the, the key and, and the reason hotels are regulated is because there needs to be some oversight. And taxation is one way to do that, right? Uh, that money will be raised can help actually give the infrastructure to oversee these, these uh, pop-up, uh, I guess you call them pop-up hotels or these B&Bs. Uh, and, and to be honest, I've used them. Uh, lots of my friends have used them. And, and they're very convenient sometimes. But at the same time, it is, uh, we have a system in the city that is regulated. Uh, if you're going to have an Airbnb in Boston or in a major city, I think that it, it should be taxed and it should be regulated. 
What are some of the issues? Uh, we've got exactly four and a half minutes left. What are some of the issues that are, are important to you and y you could make an impact on if elected? If elected, uh, my, my main goal if elected is to reform our criminal justice system is, and do it without uh, uh, steps and bounds. I want to take leaps, right, leaps. We have a system that is so overworked, at least from a defense side, that it's not even a real criminal justice system. 90% uh, of all people who are charged with anything uh, they accept a plea deal, right? Prosecutors have unlimited power to, to decide who to charge. And for some reason, there are lots of people who suggest the reasons for this. I, I don't know the exact reasons, but it disproportionately affects low-income people, uh, people of color, and, uh, and it needs to stop. Uh, we also need treatment programs uh, instead of uh, uh, pretrial programs. We need treatment programs. The prosecutors should say, all right, this is a, a drug offense. Uh, this guy was nonviolent. Uh, the record, he has no record of selling drugs. Uh, mandatory, you go to this treatment program, right? Save, uh, it'll save the state money. It'll save uh, 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 the person arrested money. And it won't ruin their life, right? I mean, we live in a system now where one, one terrible mistake, and we've all made mistakes, I've made them, you've made them, uh, uh, can detrimentally affect your entire life. And, and what do you do then? You know, you lose hope. You lose uh, your unproductive citizen in society, and we end up paying for it anyways. Uh, it's worth the time. It's worth the effort. Even if people, it takes two or three times to go through a treatment program, it's worth it. It's worth it to have someone who's a productive member of society, whose family isn't torn up about, you know, uh, their, their son being addicted to heroin or, or fentanyl or, or some other uh, nasty drug. And so my, all of my, my legislation will be directed towards uh, uh, reforming our criminal justice system, the treatment program, the mental health programs, and making them mandatory in certain instances. All right, uh, look into that camera, the camera to the left of the monitor, and in uh, 30 seconds to a minute, tell the people of North Attleboro why they should elect Chris Alexoff mm -hmm. as their state senator. There are so many good reasons to elect me, but uh, the fact of the matter is, our, our legislature is not uh, representative of our society anymore. Uh, they move slow in an age where, you know, technology and business moves fast. Uh, I think the vast majority of the legislatures are over the age of 50. Um, the vast majority are under the age of, uh, there are a very small minority under age of the 40. And so nobody is looking out for, for, for the future generations who are just as big as the baby boomers. The millennials are just as big as the baby boomers and the decisions that we're making the legislature is making it directly affect the people who have the least say in, in how in how the future should be governed right and so I think I'm not uh, voting for me means you're voting for someone who's not scared to uh, take on the MBTA to uh, make unpopular decisions because they're the right one to make the hard decision uh, to not uh, I don't care about a uh, political uh, uh, you know a political w or what's politically correct when it comes to to making uh, decisions that have to be made someone has to make these hard decisions someone has to fix the MBTA somebody has to fix our infrastructure somebody has to stop you know uh, these crazy tax programs somebody has to bring bu bureaucracy down and and it's you know I have no problem doing that uh, and so I think I think that's the change that uh, the district really needs thank you so much thank you Chris Alexoff, the Democratic candidate for state Senate. And, of course, North TV will have live election coverage on that race and also the state representative, Ray Scott Dubuque versus Betty Poirier, on election night beginning at 9 o'clock on our community channel. That's Comcast Channel 15 and Verizon Channel 24. Thank you for watching this edition of Inside Town Government.